Hello, and thank you for joining us as people are being admitted into our group. Welcome to the BIMXT Network. Today, we have a very special presentation from Autodesk experts, Nicole Thomas and Ali Atabi. My name is Dana DeFilippi, coming from my, my home office in Washington. I'm sorry, actually in Virginia now. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a BIM technologist at Smith Group, also an active participant in other BIM groups, such as Your Desk University and BIM Thoughts. So with BIM XT, we have five user groups along the East Coast that have come together to bring you this network. The network is run by a board of advisors to help guide the meetings. Our hope is to provide a live forum for people to share and connect on processes and tools related to building modeling. As a side note, these meetings are recorded and provided online, so you can view them anytime. And with that being said, we do have a LinkedIn group. Nicole and Ali are part of this group, so if you want to find them, you can go to our BIMXT network, which the link is here. You can also find it through my page because I am also a part of that group, and hopefully we are linked. With that being said, we want this to be a very interactive group today, as we do in every presentation. We want the chat to be very active. Um, you know, we want that you guys to ask your questions about BIM 360, how you're using it, how you're not using it, um, anything that you might have. So please, please let us know. Um, we do have a randomly selected survey participant from last time. So congratulations, Kevin. Hopefully you're with us today. You win a $25 gift card and somebody from CAD Micro will be reaching out to you. As I mentioned, please, please utilize the chat tools. They are down there in Zoom, so you can get to them quite easily. We want this to be interactive, both questions, comments, experiences, anything that you might have. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole and Ali. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. Happy to be here, Dana. Yes, thanks, Dana. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Happy to have you. Really excited to, to learn about BIM 360 and, and all it has to offer. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and throw in a poll. What are you guys using BIM 360 for? This is a multiple choice, so please let us know all of the things that you are currently, that you know of, utilizing BIM 364 at your company or within your projects. Um, I know, obviously, probably the basic one, if you're using BIM 360 at all, um, is probably going to be design collaboration or document management, right? You're collaborating your models up there and able to share them across the, the cloud. Give you guys a, another minute or two to answer these. I know there's quite a few options there. Get some constructability, some quality management. Remember, we do have those, you know, markup and issue tools, which I'm super excited to, to learn a little bit more today about. So let me get these polls shared here. So as I mentioned, right, 70% as I thought on document management, design collaboration, but pretty even split across the others outside of coordination, right? So that's pretty good to see. With that being said, I'm going to stop sharing those results. So, Nicole, Ali, where are you guys joining us from today? I know I'm looking out and seeing some sleet. It's not even necessarily snow over here in Virginia, which is kind of sad. I'm currently joining from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, we got a pounded with snow the last day or so, but um, it's beautiful and sunny and all the roads are clear here. So, typical <laughs> nice Utah wintry day. Yeah, and I'm typically based in Boston, but um, temporarily in, down in Florida, enjoying the uh, warm better. So um, perfect timing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, couldn't be better. <laughs> Let's go ahead and ask our participants. Where are you guys joining us from? Seems as though we have gotten a bit far out of our typical zone of the mid. East Atlantic kind of region, which is really exciting. If you do not see somewhere that you are from on here or somewhere outside of the U.S., please let us know specifically where you're calling from. I'd love to hear that. 
And we'll share these results. So 40, about half northeast, right? But we're getting, we're getting pretty spread out, which is pretty awesome. Asia, Europe. So I'd yeah, love to hear it, where you guys are calling from. It, it, shout out to those people because it's um, pretty late or really early, right? Yeah, seriously. So thank you guys so much for joining us. All right. Well, without further ado, I'd love to hear about what you guys have to share about BIM 360. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so we can start with introducing ourselves, if you want, Nicole and I, and then I will take on the first part of the presentation, go over document management, design collaboration, and um, a couple other functionality. And then I will hand it over to Nicole for the second part of it. Um, since I have the mic now, I'm, my name is Ali, and thank you, Dana, for having us here. I work as a subject matter expert at Autodesk. I've been with Autodesk about two and a half years now, and previously I was working in architecture. My background is in architecture. Um, and, and yeah, I'm happy to be here and, and um, happy to go over uh, the, the BIM 360 and the functionality here. Nicole? Thanks, Ali. Let me unmute. Thanks, Ali. Let me make sure I'm unmuted here. Um, pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, I've been at Autodesk for about a little over four years now. Um, work, I currently work in the education sphere, helping our universities and colleges um, in their construction management and civil engineering programs utilize our BIM 360 software or any other type of software. However, I've worked in consulting, supporting our con large GCs and construction firms. Um, I've worked in support as well. And then um, before my time at Autodesk, I used to work for Turner Construction as a BIM manager for quite some time. So, <laughs> hey, and I do see Mr. Ryan Pastor online. Um, I actually went to uh, BIM University with Ryan. So there's a couple of few familiar faces on here. It's great to see everybody. That's really exciting. We love making those connections. This is what BIMXT yeah. is all about. <laughs> yeah, I do see a couple of familiar names here, too. Glad to see everyone was able to join. All right. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen and then we can kick it off. There isn't anything else that we wanna uh, go through. All right, can everyone see my screen? Sure can. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, one thing that I wanna start off with is you probably heard about the recent announcements and probably noticed some branding changes and name changes. So there is a um, unified platform. If you were part of AU and you were able to join, you got a little bit of a glimpse of that. That's out now. And BIM 360 is officially renamed as BIM Collaborate Pro. Um, it is for the presentation today, we decided to really keep it on the BIM 360 side of things. Um, but if, of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those and, and go over those in the, during the Q&A. Uh, we, we have a good chunk of time that's available for that, so, um, so it'll be a good, good conversation. Um, but I saw on the poll that there, there was about 70 people using document uh, management. I'm guessing that about 30 people are not super familiar with BIM 360 at all. Um, so I'll start a little bit on the broader side and then go into some of the details, especially collaboration details or collaboration workflows uh, for everyone to see. Because a lot of times, at least uh, from uh, the clients that I interact with, um, many, especially in architecture, are really focused on the Revit cloud work sharing side of things, um, but not fully utilizing everything else that comes with the platform. So hopefully that will give you, today my presentation will give you um, some insight and, and, um, and, and you, will, you will take advantage of those tools as well. So that being said, I want to start off with the, um, with the document management. And during this presentation, if you have any questions that come up, just feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then we can we can address them at the end. Uh, but um, for those that are uninitiated, uh, BIM 360 is a common data environment that essentially allows you to store any project data that you have uh, that are related to your project. It can be um, anything that's 
only your firm is using or it allows you a platform to collaborate with external users, owners, any kind of stakeholders that are relevant to your project. Uh, what it allows you to do is that um, because it's a common data environment, the biggest um, aspect of it is that when you are trying to reach for a document or access a file, you know that you're always accessing the latest and the greatest. Uh, why is that important? Because previous to cloud storage and, and work sharing, uh, a lot of communication happened via email, a lot of happened via phone, um, even and before that, even CDs and, and, and thumb drives. What, what happened and what we noticed is that um, when, when you're communicating via email, things can get out of hand. You can send the documentation and then all of a sudden you have to send the revised one because you, you forgot something and then now you have to send another email to everyone. But then the receiving end of it, the person might not really see that, that email come in and might be using the old one that you sent. And all of a sudden you're, you're losing work or you're losing time because you're simply going off of a um, outdated document. So at a very high level, BIM 360 platform um, eliminates that, um, but also at the same time, just because everything is a common, with, saved in, it's in a common data environment, that gives you a lot of different functionalities and functionality that uh, a lot of um, workflows that wasn't available before. Um, but just diving right into it, I'll start with the document management. The, the, the platform has many different modules that are attached to it. Uh, it's actually a, uh, like I said, it's a platform. So there are multiple products that are associated with it. And each of those products use different modules uh, to accomplish uh, different workflows. Uh, the base of it is document management. And everything starts off with the document management. Um, you don't have to enable or, or use anything else uh, but, but document management. But essentially, it is, it is where you save all your files. Uh, this is the page that, that, um, that will look, um, that's how it will look. When you're in a project, you have your folders. Within your folders, you have your files. It's very typical to a you know, Windows Explorer or other. Um, or, or, or a network um, drive. But um, essentially, it allows you to um, organize things and store it. But on top of that, when you're looking at the screen right now, as you can see, there are a couple columns that are available to you so that at a glance, you can see if they're like what version is a folder is or a file is, um, what's the size of it, if there are any markups, issues, RFIs, that are associated with it, and you can you can view all of those. And if I just go into in here, we can probably see that with a folder. I'm sorry, with a file itself. So the the version, if this has markups, issues, if this file has been approved or denied previously, you have a quick review of that too. And if you had RFIs, we had those too. But what I want to talk about is um, as, a, as a common data environment, one of the advantages of BIM360 is that you can view Autodesk desktop products, um, files that you're working on, on Revit or AutoCAD or, or, or other files or format. When you save it, now you have the ability to view those files without actually opening the desktop product itself. That gives a level of flexibility. So uh, there is a there is a iOS app that that you can use Bim 360 in as well. So, but um, you can you can use that if you're on the site or if you have a uh, computer at work and a laptop at home. Uh, it really doesn't matter. You have access to it um, on any location. But it also gives uh, people that are not really part of the documentation process to step in and view anything that they want also, uh, without the fear of actually messing things up, especially if they're not familiar with Revit. That used to be a problem, um, hopefully not anymore, but you know you can always run into that. And also use it as a communication or a collaboration platform too. Um, what 
BIM 360 allows you to do if you use it as a collaboration is that everything is recorded and everything is logged. So uh, whether you want to review what has been done before, you will have access to it or simply because of archiving um, uh, requirements that it's a, it's, it provides a good, good way of um, keeping record of everything that happened for a project. Very quickly, once you click a Revit file, this is um, an example. You can you have 3D support as well as 2D support. What that means is that I can view 3D models as I want. I have tools that are available to me down at the bottom um, where I can set up a section if I want to, to view something on here, move that section around and take a look at more details. I can get rid of that or I can simply walk in as a first person too if I'm trying to go around and take a look. At the same time, um, because again, this is a Revit model, I have all of the metadata that's available in Revit and it's accessible to me from here. I can at any moment click on the properties um, window over here. Let me just move this guy here. It's getting hidden because I'm in 3D. But I can, I can select an item and then I will see what, what it is um, and what are some of the um, <clears throat> element properties that are associated with that. Um, and I can do that for any, any Revit element that's, that's available in here. And uh, another item is that I mentioned 2D, 3D support, right? So I'm, I'm in 3D, I can view this, this data, but if I have any sheets that I have chosen to publish from Revit, I also have access to those in here. So I can come in here, um, review those, those sheets. Um, and, and what I can do is you'll, you'll notice the, the, the toolbar over here where I can place markups. This is where <clears throat> the collaboration side kicks in, where I can review a file and um, make you know, clouds, cloud something or put in a, um, a call out. Um, as whatever I want to um, mark up in this drawing. And I have two options. I can either keep this private, which is default, or I can publish this. And if I publish it and let's save it, now this is available to everyone else on the project that has access to this file. So essentially it's a, um, it's a on the spot um, markup or redlining tool that, that you can use to communicate with your team or simply note something that you think should be, um, uh, should be, made, uh, should be known to everyone else on the project. Rather and than this is, this is web-based, right? So not only do I, I'm not worrying about, you know, somebody on the team who doesn't know Revit messing up the model or having to download Revit or what have you, but you could look at this on your tablet. You know, it's really easily accept, accessible right? You don't need to download Bluebeam or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's all just a web-based application that's working pretty seamlessly. So a yeah, few questions exactly. here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Exactly. So um, you, can, you can review this on any browser. I'm using Chrome. Um, and also you, you mentioned the app, right? So if I'm going to be going onto the field, uh, app actually even lets you download files in advance. So if you know that you won't have internet connection when you're out in the field, when you're at the office or at home, you can, you can pre-download those on your iPad. And when you go there, you'll actually still have access to it, uh, which is a neat feature. Um, and, and essentially, yes. Yeah, so all, all of a sudden now, if I'm, if, when we look at a, like just remembering from my time working in an architecture firm, we have the uh, principal, we have maybe someone in charge of the design, we have a project manager and we have designers. And a lot of times, you, I, you know, at least I was able to see them struggle, go into a Revit file and try to find something that they need. And a lot of times what, that, what, what happened is like an email to the, to the design team or the drafting team saying that, hey, I, I really need to get this information. Can you send it to me as a PDF? And that's, that's wasted time, right? It's, it's one of those things that a lot of people don't really think about, but when you consider the life of a project, 
especially if it's a complex one, is constantly happening between multiple people, it adds up very quickly. That could have been time that you spend designing another part of the building or, or getting things done for the next delivery. Absolutely. So the system so allows you to do that. A few questions come in, a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> so what are the adoption rates like? Are you seeing a lot of people using the issues and markup tools within the BIM 360 platform? Yeah, that's a good question. And unfortunately, I don't have insight to that. That would be a great thing to ask to Sasha, who is the um, product mm -hmm. manager. I know they have their own sessions as well, um, outreach sessions. Um, he, she would be able to give a better idea. But earlier on, I, I had a personal anecdote where I actually didn't see a lot of my customers utilize um, some of these features and I partially wanted to you know come out in here and really talk about it because you have access to it it is neat and it's very useful take advantage of it it's not only Absolutely. Revit there when you're using it it's not only Revit Cloud Workshare which great which is very helpful by itself but there is all this other functionality that you can take advantage and and um, as a result uh, work more efficiently so there is a question on FedRAMP, which I feel as though could be a mm -hmm. complete presentation within itself. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take that? <laughs> Maybe just a quick gist of... I can also mm -hmm. take that, Ali, if you want me to. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so currently, that's something that we're working on. And I was actually just grabbing some of our security white papers and trust centers um, to put in the chat. So I'll go ahead and put those in as far as FedRAMP goes. But I know that's one of our has been a main Autodesk goal is that we are um, FedRAMP compliant so that all our government contractors have the ability to use BIM 360 and um, yeah, you just utilize it on any project. So we're definitely getting there. Absolutely. Exactly. And there are a lot of um, different, um, you know, compliances. The security white paper that Nicole mentioned is the best way to um, find out about those and the details uh, so that you're, sh you're sure that it's it, the, the system and the platform is compliant. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that those get shared up on our LinkedIn page as well. So thank you so much for that, Nicole. A few other questions. There's a question about markup and whether it stays. Thank you, Kevin Keeler, for answering that. Yes, it does stay. Um, you want to maybe give a quick gist or just say, we're going to get to markups. Um, yeah, so markups are, so now in this version for this file, everyone else that has access to it, the permission to view this file will be able to see it because I simply came in here and I was I made it available to, um, I published it for everyone else. So if I were to just create another one real quick, you'll just see that in here, I just make sure that this is published. As soon as I do this, it's available to everyone. And on how my do you team. get that guy to go away? The guide to go away, um, you mean like the? The markup. Um, yeah, right, so like I, I can. I, you know, it's done. I've done the, you know, I've issued a new PDF and now I just, ah. I need that text to go away. You can archive it. So on the left-hand side, you have a um, couple uh, toolbars available in there, markup. So for this file, I can see a list of everything in here too. So I don't have to look at every single page. Uh, to reach a markup. Um, it's listed for me. But if I archive this, uh, this will be hidden by default. And I can still open it up. I can just say show archived. Uh, but at least now it's out of mind. And I don't have to worry about it. And it doesn't take up real estate on the screen. But if I just want to close markups while I'm trying to look something on the drawing itself, I can always come down here and just hide it all. Um, hide all Is that pages. new? Pervy just said she just found it, but I feel like that wasn't there forever. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's been here for some time now, um, at least a year, uh, but I might be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but you have it now, so. Okay, one last question before you guys move on. Is it possible to change the color slash icon for things like issues and RFIs on the drawings? Currently, the yellow circle. Or yeah, that's square. by default. Um, I don't think, I don't know a way to change those unless Nicole, do you know a way to change those? Uh, currently those are associated based on the status. So there isn't a, um, way to change those. Um, however, in some of the other platforms or modules, you have the ability to modify statuses, which would then allow you to, um, change those. 
Yeah. Awesome. Love all the questions, love everything yeah. going on in the chat. Love you guys answering each other. This is exactly what we want. So please continue. Okay. All right. So moving on, I want to also talk about, so since we're in the um, uh, collaboration tool sets, what I want to talk about is issue management. So markup is, markups, markups are great for just getting something on your mind on here and it's, it's available to you or everyone else. But if you want, if you find out a problem or an issue and it needs to be fixed and, and, and um, uh, needs to be taken care of, um, and, and it's something that you want to simply um, uh, send it as an informal way of doing it, so it's not necessarily an RFI, um, you can use issue management. And what it allows you to do is you have a list of them available and you can create an issue and point, place a, a dot on the screen that you're looking at. And with that, you will then have the option either use a template if there is a type of issue that you're constantly creating. You don't have to type everything over and over again. This is fairly new um, functionality if you haven't um, seen it before. Um, but essentially, I can identify what the issue is. I can identify, I can put down a title. Um, and then the most important part is really assign it to a person, a company, or a role. So let's say this is a design problem and we need to make sure uh, clearances, if I can write. And then um, I'll use Windows to help me out there. But I can then come in here and let's say I'm going to um, blast my friend Stephen Bissett. He won't mind. But I'll assign this to Stephen and tell him that, hey, you know, there is a clearance problem. We need to fix it. Um, here, here are the details. I can put in a, a due date as well. It's up to me. Um, and enter any other additional information that I want to include in here, even a description. Um, you can also um, customize certain entries in here. There you can see a lessons learned one too, which is, which is helpful. Um, so you, there is some room for customization for this. But essentially, as soon as I hit create, what happens is that Steven is going to receive an email. And in that email, there will be a link. And if he clicks that link, he'll be taking directly to this page right here. So imagine if I had to send an email, I would have to type what the problem is, but also have to point them to either with a screenshot or say, hey, it's on A101. I don't remember what, what plan I'm on. But A101 is the door that's in, that's in one, of the, one of the rooms. He would have to go and open up the PDF or the physical drawing and try to understand it. And if there are two, at the, uh, two similar rooms, obviously that can be a point of um, confusion and back and forth. This allows him to immediately get to there and waste no time and understand what I'm talking about and, and get to work. And if it's still not clear within the issue itself, um, you can add attachments. So it can be anything that's supplemental to this. It can be PDFs, JPEGs. They just have to be saved on the project uh, document management system. Or I can type a comment to him and say, hey, you know, it's Steven. If I can. And I have my iPad in front of me for my notes, so I have to go around it. But hey, Steven, you know, um, I'll just put test and then send it over to him. And now this is recorded in here. And we can basically have a conversation. It's not a really long um, email thread uh, that, that we're discussing this. It's all in here. If Steven moves on to something else or another project, another team member will be able to come in here and still see these. Uh, and you don't have to catch them up on everything. It's, it's right there. All that information is here. And obviously, if there is a um, litigation problem later on, you can always come back and refer to it as well. And as a receiver of the issue, uh, Stephen can come in and if he's done and did the work, he can come in and say, hey, I answered it. Here's, here's what it is. I'll punt it back at you, Ali. Or he can say, this is closed. It's all set. I can add final thoughts um, or comments and then hit save. And now this issue is done. It's out of mind. Uh, and when you start using this a lot of times and start using it for communication, 
internally or even externally. So you can, I mentioned you can assign it to a company, right? So you can say, hey, you know, interior designer, everyone in that team gets that email saying that we need to make sure that this is coordinated and you can do so with that one issue and, and you're done and you can focus on other things. And from here, <clears throat> I can also use, um, for instance, let, let me go back. I'm, I think I, I actually forgot to talk about this. Is there is something neat in here? Let me jump onto the second floor plan. But one of the um, uh, advantages or, or um, ease of use that I find in the, in the platform is, is the connectivity between 2D and 3D. Um, you're really, it's not just a PDF printout you're really using all the tools that are available to you. Your, your staff or yourself are spending so much time adding details and putting all that information in, the, in, in your BIM, right? And, and in your Revit model. So um, why lose all of that? You get access to it. One way is I'm in this page reviewing my second floor plan. I have a um, place me tool in here which I can use to say, okay, you know, I, I get the plan, but let me take a look at it in 3D. Um, I don't fully understand what I'm looking at. And there you go. You can immediately jump in. And now I'm viewing it in 3D without really switching pages, going back to Revit, coming back to here. I can do all of that right here um, instantly. <clears throat> and then if I exit here real quick, I can do the same with split view mode so i have my plan on one hand and then my 3d model on the other hand and i can scroll through different views too if i want to take a look at two things at the same time um, and uh, fully supports that functionality too which just simply makes your life easier and then <clears throat> Then moving on, others, other than obviously direct co collaboration, one of the things that I want to make sure that I cover in here is um, something called change management. Uh, so every version of a published Revit model is available to you in, in the platform. What that allows you to do is now I can use it as a reference uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for backups. And you can compare different versions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to V2. I just know that there are some changes between these two in our demo product pro, uh, project. But if I hit compare, um, <clears throat> the system will go through your entire Revit model. And then it's going to give me a list of everything that has been added, that has been removed, and that has been changed. Now, um, it's going to take a couple of seconds in here, but in a minute, what we'll see is that a list being generated and color coded uh, according to what those different items are. And I can filter things out, et cetera. Essentially, what this helps with is, is especially useful when you're coordinating, because if you're getting a model from a um, you know, lighting designer or HVAC um, engineer, you don't have to rely on their narrative. Uh, to tell you what has changed in the project. You can just rely on the system and just get to that information right away. And I mentioned about edit, removed, and modified. I have them in here. The list is now pretty long, but I can filter those out so I, I know every single item that's happening. I can even go further and say if there are any you know doors or walls that have been changed, just change me those and very quickly I can see that. And if I click on it, I can even get additional details in here and it's, and it's highlighted. This is amazing. Can you define at all what those changes are? I feel like that could get really intense in terms of how that, I mean, what, what does it, a change actually entail, right? Like, yeah, G great question. So this, this works specifically well for Revit because anytime an element property is changed, the system will identify that as a change right? Or if you move it, but it's the same element, it'll basically track element ID. And then anything that has been, um, that have happened to it, it'll mark it as changed um, if there is a difference between the two. Um, obviously, if you remove it and add a new one, then it's going to register it as one item removed and one item added. 
um, and it'll list this too. But if you're using it for simply PDF, which this still works, um, it's more straightforward. At that point, our system overlays uh, two color-coded images, one older one, one newer one, one in blue, one in red, then you can still visually identify what the changes are, but at that point, it's simply an overlay of two, two different uh, versions on top of each other. So if I wanted to see just the elements that have moved, is there any way to kind of filter those changes to a significant change that's been made? Um, so in terms of like adding um, like conditions and et cetera, uh, yeah, no, like, it's more or, straightforward, okay. but I can download this list and um, it'll give me an Excel sheet. And now from there, then I can look at Perfect. element IDs and dive and a little bit We could even use that deep. in Dynamo. Exactly. <laughs> I had to throw it in there, guys. I yep. see you, Dan. I see you laughing at me. Yeah, we love automation. So I'm <laughs> totally for that. So can Dan actually has a question, um, and it looks like Nicole got to it, but can um, you actually create issues from it here, like, or markups of any kind? I guess you could obviously screenshot it, but is there a way to maybe create notes within this atmosphere for you to share across the team in any way? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, not directly within this page, um, but as a way to make that work, you can always create a markup, I guess, on the on the file itself. But yeah, that's, um, I don't think there is a way to do that. Nicole, are you um, familiar for a way of a way to, to make that happen? No, unfortunately not. Um, yeah, not exactly. from this window, so. Yeah. It and looks like Terry says if you click on the modification type tab right there, right next to where it says disciplines affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there is different filter options. Okay, in terms of like what you're actually seeing graphically, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that's really, really cool. But I guess if, you know, if you're taking notes in terms of changes or somebody is listening in the future in terms of, you know, the, the production team, it would be really cool to say, okay, I just want to see the elements who ha that have had their properties change, or I just want to see the elements, you know, graphically because unfortunately, with me loving Dynamo so much, I can see that being really, like, the whole thing is yellow because I've run a script on all the doors or all of the, you mm -hmm. know, so it, it could almost be, like, useless in that way. But well, it's, still, once I mean, again, because you can export it, you could filter the mm -hmm. list down, start to get some element IDs, filter them that way in Revit and do some other things. So totally useful data. Just curious. Exactly. It's more useful, not for you per se, but for the person that's on the receiving end of it. Because for them, anything that you have done in, in Dynamo, if you're just simply updating um, attributes and other things, they won't be able to see it unless they actually go in and take a look at it, right? right. So for them, it's like, hey, like, you know, whoa, it's a lot of yellow, but hey, there is a good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a conversation starter with you so they can actually ask you what has changed, right? So... Um, but of course, the removal part, like what's been removed or added is also important because if there Definitely. was a, um, you know, uh, HV, uh, HV, um, HVAC doc, doc somewhere and, and it wasn't there before, now you can see that it's, and you have to coordinate and move lights around, around the, the It's thing. nice that that list is filterable. You know, you can just right. switch between the, absolutely. So very useful. Right. And I know, I just realized that I've, taking so much time <laughs> and I want to live <laughs> we've had so many questions Nicole. that's the beautiful thing of it is there's so many um so much you know conversation going on right there in the yeah. chat so absolutely and I love the questions and keep them coming um but I what Nicole is going to talk about is really important too and I from the um the polling I saw that a lot of people actually don't have a lot of experience with that part of it too so I definitely want to wrap up here my part so um, Nicole can take over but before I do that I just want to point out the project home in here because kind of a way to tie everything together um, all the you know issues I talked about issues we know the data the common data environment and all these things as people are adding more issues and sending them to uh, to to different co-workers and and other parties project home ties all that together because I have this page that I can customize according 
to the way that I want it to be. Um, every person has their right, and you're not mess messing up with anyone else's project home. But at one glance, when I open it up in the beginning of the day, for instance, I can see all of the issues that are assigned to me. Or if I'm a project manager, I can say, I want to see all of the company issues that happen. And of course, in a, in a demo, right? We, that got to um, happen. It's all, it has to happen. <laughs> it wouldn't be a demo if something didn't break. Exactly. And <laughs> I have been having multiple taps, so it's probably telling me, to, you need to refresh. Um, here we go. So I have all of the project issues that are listed in here. Um, or I can filter by all of the company issues that are assigned. So at one glance, you know, I, I, I know what's due, how many came in, um, and how many we're behind on, or simply how many have been um, addressed. And understand the, the process that, um, or the, the stage that my team is at uh, without, um, you know, going into the, the model and, and looking and checking everything. Uh, it's a good way to have an overall um, chart to, to view this information. And this works for other things too. So if you have RFIs, they'll list in here. If you have checklists, that'll list in here. You can even add more where you can say, hey, just show me the design issues. Maybe you you only care about the design problems, nothing else. You can do so and you can customize that as well. And, and everything is in here. Yeah. And this is this would be an architect's point of view, right? Designer's point of view. I care about the issues. And then Nicole, as the contractor side of things, will be looking at similar but completely different um, window uh, to to prioritize things that 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 are relevant to her. And um, with that, what I'll do is I'll I'll hand it over to Nicole so that she can show you. Uh, what that looks like. Thanks, Ali. Mm -hmm. Lots of great questions from everybody. Um, definitely keep them coming. Um, I'm going to try to watch the chat as well as presenting. Um, obviously, there's a lot of content. Um, Ali went over as well as me. I'm going to kind of go through some of the basic functionality from some of the other um, portions of BIM 360 and how kind of a contractor might use it. And then as you guys ask questions, we can really kind of dive into um, some of those specific items if there's some more things that you guys want me to cover. So I'll go kind of quickly because I know I want to show you lots of content in the little bit of time that we have left. Um, there was a question in the chat that came up earlier about notifications and getting those. So I just wanted to cover that um, when you're going through your notification settings um, about receiving emails for issues under your profile name, there is a notification settings box that allows you to um, check how much of the, the time the, that you want to receive emails so that you're not getting overloaded or bombarded. This is also set by the project admin. So this one um, I can change because the project admin has allowed me to change, but you can see that if I wanted, you know, to be reminded instantly of, of issues or if that was too much, I could be reminded daily or hourly. So just kind of an update there. Um, Ali talked about and he showed the project home dashboard about, you know, what we're looking at. So this is your starting page, right? That checklist box where we're coming into that, that first part of the day um, when I can see any of my field issues or project issues and I can really click on any of these items. And it'll take me to those specific areas so I can look at those. Um, I wanted to focus and highlight a little bit more on the risk portion um, because this is kind of more of a newer feature in BIM 360. And um, it's kind of our new construction IQ technology, which is taking the data that you're inputting into BIM 360 and um, outlining um, risks so that we know where to focus. So that as your subcon or your foremans come in for the day, they know where they need to focus or, or highlight. Um, so in our project um, home, this is that home page that we started off. I'm going to jump to my insight dashboard where it dives into this more um, deeply, and I've already got that tab open, so I'm going to go to the next tab here. So you can see here's my project risk. Now this is is um, populated by those issues that you're you're putting in here um, and it you know has different issues depending on you know your your safety risk so what safety issues are being um, risen whether they're housekeeping items um, how many checklists are completed and we'll go over those in a second with overview issues and it kind of just gives a risk score for the day um, you can see this is a low risk today but we could definitely take a look at our safety risk or whatever the case may be um, I'm going to focus on our design risk today because I know we have quite a few designers on the call um, so I can say, you know, here are my design risks, and it looks like there's, you know, 45 documentation incomplete issues. Um, so I can click on this, and I can see that these are the issues that need to be complete. So I can quickly get a, an overview of 
what documentation needs to be complete, where are my critical components. You can see that here these are openings and embeds or elevators, and that's why they're labeled as such. Um, let me go back to documentation incomplete, and you can see that I can click on one of these IDs. Um, you can see that the construction IQ is kind of populating this view um, with the building components being that elevator, which is a critical component, and then those root causes, that documentation conflict or that documentation incomplete, which is then going to flag construction IQ um, to do that or assign that um, to this risk. Um, this is still being developed and researched out. We've got a lot of people that are using this on a project um, as far as um, utilizing it and filling out the data, um, but it's a really great overview um, allow, to allow you to do this. Um, there's a question about the executive overview. Um, I believe um, the executive overview allows you, that's at an account-based level, so instead of looking at the risk for a project-based level, you can look at the risk basically over an entire account, which has all the BIM 360 projects in it. Um, and I'm not sure that it allows you to drill completely down to into those projects um, with like the specific IDs or the issues, but I do believe it allows you to drill down to, into specific projects, um, but we can follow up on that. Um, Okay, and then um, so after, so you have your risk here, there's a lot of different, you know, different project controls you can jump between, you know, looking at those specific design issues and charts, um, you know, looking at your quality issues or those safety issues, especially for those foremans or those safety inspectors as they're going through to see, you know, where they need to focus um, for that day. Okay. Um, these reports can all be exported out, um, which is nice because I know that a lot of people, especially in the contractor world, like those paper copies to be able to do that. And you can set those reports to run daily, monthly, um, hourly if you wanted to. Um, and then you could have those you know, for your meetings um, every day. All right. Ali talked about the document management, you know, and um, the nice thing is, is that we're completing that life cycle between design and construction where those design documents are uploaded here and then all their contractors are, have access to be able to view those same models and those same documents. And as they're published out, we have those particular um, sets available and we have the same ability to make those, part, those um, issues and those markups on those drawings, um, just like those architects or designers would be. And um, I'm gonna jump into our field management module. And as I'm jumping into these tabs, I'm just jumping in between the different modules here to kind of quickly cover and save some time to show you the functionality. Um, when I jump into our field management module, and a lot of this is done on the iPad app, right? You take your iPad or your phone, whether Android or iOS on the field, and you're actually working through these and, and pulling this up. Um, these issues that are coming through are synced across the entire project for BIM 360. So whether I have a design issue or whether I have a safety issue, um, they're all wrapped up together so that no matter where I'm at, I can be able to view those issues at any time and I can filter out by those issues to see you know, what I want and proceed to you know, update the status like Ali showed or, or change those different things. Um, the other thing that you can do, especially in the field when we're doing, is we do checklists, right? So every job has something that needs to be checked, whether it's a project safety walk, whether, you know, you're looking at, you know, setting up a COVID screening for your job site so that as people come in, they can jump on an iPad and complete those COVID screenings and you have a record of that and it's all saved in BIM 360. Um, the other thing you can do with this is, you know, we focus a lot on equipment and um you know, making sure that those are on site and they're ready, right? So we can create checklists for our air handling units or electrical gear or anything like that. Um, and you can see that as we go through this, you know, checklist, we can create templates so that we have those templates in advance. We publish those um, checklists to those templates and then we can complete those for every single item. And you can see as I go through and maybe I mark a fail on something that comes through, it's going to automatically create that issue. So we're, we're completing that, um, that side of the, or that um, complete circle, right? So that I can click on this issue here and I can see um, that particular item or attachments here or the activity as far as that issue has been completed and proceed to move through that. So that we're tying those things together, okay? Um, uh, somebody asked me to ask up a, or open an, a class issue, a clash issue in field, and I will do that in just a second. I did also want to note that with these checklists, we do have the ability to also tie them to pieces of equipment. So on the right-hand side, you can see that I have, you know, my checklist information, when it's scheduled, the location, what type it is, commissioning. And then I also have a linked asset so that as I go through um, my process, I'm also tying it to pieces of equipment, specific pieces of equipment um, that I can then look at. 
So let me jump back to my issues tab at the top and I will open up a clash issue real quick. Um, so you can see that I have a coordination clash issue here. Um, I can go ahead and open that. You can see that here's my description. There's the photo of that clash issue there. And then I have the ability to view any attachments as well as the screenshot and pull it up and see where that clash, clash issue is um, and any activity associated to that clash status. Okay. Um, let me run through. Uh, so with that, as far as we've got our checklist, I showed you that that asset that was kind of associated to that. Um, so I don't know if some of you have seen our new asset tracking module that allows you to click on particular assets and be able to jump to that asset module and track that. Um, this is the one that we talked about. Um, we had a question about statuses and changing statuses and status colors. Um, this is what you can do in the asset module where you can specify um, a particular assets and items by their categories. Um, this can all be created. I've seen this done for not only electrical or ductwork or, or you know, that mechanical MEP equipment that you see, but also for furniture systems or room schedules, right? You're tracking rooms and how they're done or what status they are, um, like maybe it's a hotel that you need to track. And so you can customize each one of these statuses here um, in their color so that you can... Um, you know, change those along the way and we can keep track of those those assets. And then, you know, those issues um, automatically come through. So that issue that I just marked up in that checklist comes through right here. I can click on that issue and open it and I see that same view as well as going to that checklist that I was looking at and you can see that it's in progress and so it's all tied together. If I had additional drawings here, I could also click on those drawings um, and be able to see those particular items. Okay. All right, let me go ahead and just look at some things in the chat. I want to make sure I get you guys' questions. There is one question, Nicole, from Steve. He's asking um, for a workflow if the designer is not using BIM 360 and if you can take advantage of um, coordination within the platform. Yes, absolutely. Um, so let's jump into model coordination. I'm going to skip a little bit over our RFIs and submittals for now and jump into model coordination. So um, we talked about this central data platform all being in BIM 360 document management, right, where everything's uploaded. So maybe your, your designers are not using BIM 360, and that's fine. Um, to take advantage of model coordination, you will need to upload those models into um, document management so that you can tell model coordination to utilize um, those models. And so I would just get those models from the architects or designers and when they come to a place and then I would put them in a particular folder here in um, document management. And the nice thing about um, model coordination is that when you're activating the model coordination model or module, you just tell it where you want it to clash. So you can have a particular folder just for model coordination here in your um, files and then say model coordination clash these, this folder and it'll clash everything um, in that particular folder, whether it's a, a hierarchy folder or a subfolder below. Um, and the nice thing about model coordination too is then you can have different model coordination spaces. So on the right hand side, you can see that there's a bunch of different model coordination spaces here where we could run, you know, one particular trades. You could set one up for each of your subcontractors and give them access to it. You could set up a design coordination or you could set up, you know, that model coordination. Um, so you can utilize uh, model coordination if you, in fact, um, just have to upload your models to um, BIM 360. And then you can tell model coordination to clash those. Then you have the ability to have all your models here. I select that model coordination space, which is assigned to this particular folder, which has these models in it. I have the ability to select any of these models and then um, hit view, and it will automatically, you know, open up those particular um, models in that view. And um, it automatically runs the clash um, detection for me so that I don't have to go through that. Um, so while that's loading, the nice thing then is I have the ability to save that view. So I can add additional or remove models. Um, I can save that view so that I can then come back to it later. I can make it private just like those markups, right? I'm private or published if I just want that view for me. Um, and I'm going to leave it as canceled for now to save time. But then I have the ability to then in this view that I just created, have the ability to see all those clashes. Um, I can see, you know, which clashes were we're sorting with. I can see what's my primary model. 
Um, so if I want to look the architect versus the other two, or if I want to say, no, I want to clash the mechanical with everything else, I can quickly change that. And then I can group objects by different items. So whether I'm doing it by a system name or whether I'm doing it by a type name or an object name, um, I have the ability to do that. And then the nice thing here with model coordination, right, is that anything that's coming up, let me go back to my architecture model. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do type name. And you can see that I have a clash with my metal roof deck. So I can go ahead and click on that. I can see these two items here. Um, if those all look good and it's not a problem, there's a button at the bottom that says not an issue. So then it takes away that clash. I have the ability to say, you know, it's a valid interface um, and go ahead and hit OK. And that's removed from my clash set. Um, and then I can proceed to go through here and review any additional clashes. Now, if it was a penetration that we wanted to really mark as a clash, um, I could go ahead and zoom in and say, yep, this is a clash here I would go ahead and create that issue um, and then it would automatically mark as a coordination class um, and I could go ahead and add a pin so let me scroll into here add a pin here you can see I have that pin it automatically creates a title I can assign it to a user just like you would any other user or issue that you were creating add location details change the description and then hit create okay and that issue is then populated um, into that big issue window that we talked about, as well as it, it diminishes those, those clashes moving forward. Okay, um, let me go ahead and um, just kind of look here, because I know we have, one other thing I did want to show you guys um, that Ali didn't mention, but um, we now have the ability in Navisworks and Revit to bull bring in those BIM 360 issues. So um, within Navisworks, I now have the ability to open specific models and I can open particular models or particular views. So that save view that I created in model coordination, I can open that up in this view and then I can see all the issues that were here. I have the ability to open them. I can make changes. You can see that it's highlighted here in this particular view. I can make any changes I need to, or if I'm in Navisworks and I'm looking at a particular issue, I can also create an issue from here. So definitely a great functionality, and there is a new issues plugin with Revit um, that has a similar ability to go in and actually view your issues from BIM 360 in your Revit model so that you're completing that design cycle of making sure that everybody's on the same page and knows where those um, examples are. All right, let me go ahead. I'm just going to skim through the chat. Um, Ali, is there some of the things that we might need to... Um, yeah, one thing to point out is the BIM, and thanks for bringing this up, Nicole. It's important. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but the issues plugin for Revit at the moment only works for 3D elements or issues that are created in a 3D view. So that adds a little bit of um, limitation when it comes to functionality uh, direct. So I know there are a couple questions about Neversworks and Clash taking that and viewing that into Revit. I haven't particular. I haven't personally um, tested that out yet, um, but if it's 3D, it should work. But um, I, we might have to get back to you on that uh, on the specifics. Okay, and the where the pin is is the location as far as where it's la logged. So wherever that pin is is going to show up in association to that Revit model or that Navisworks model. So that's where the, the location comes in. Um, as far as a clash report being exported um, to be used like um, on an iPad, so um, there's not really, so it doesn't come into like plan grid. There's some future functionality that Autodesk is developing in order to bring, you know, plan grid and BIM 360 together. So you'll see some new functionality coming out in the next year. So look for that as far as bringing those um, together. Um, but the issue report is kind of that main export, like any of the issues can be reported. So when I talked about running reports, um, you can export a report of just all of your clash issues. I um, mean, that be, might be a way to, you know, export those specific things out. Looks like we're about at our hour. We will continue to go along, but I do want to honor everybody for their time. Thank you all so much. The chat was super active today. Once again, this will be recorded, so those of you who have to drop off, we, we do appreciate you joining us and for all of the uh, participation that you provide today. Uh, do check out yourdeskuniversity.com. They have a new spring semester, bunch of AAC tech experts going to be presenting and providing 
uh, presentations in there. Um, don't forget to fill out the survey. Allison has put it in the chat. You will get an email uh, and you can potentially win $25 gift card, but we really do want your input. So what do you want to see next month? What do you want to you know, hear about? What do you want to learn about, et cetera? Please fill that out. So thank you so much and back to you guys. Okay. Is there, I'm just looking through the chat to see if there's any particular um, grouping issues in Navisworks. Um, so grouping issues is not necessarily like grouping them, but there is a filter setting. So like if you had a particular status or location or it was assigned to or a root cause, um, that's where you could also add custom attribute filters. So if you wanted to say like this was like level one or which might be your location, or maybe this was a specific pump room or something like that, you could have a custom attribute filter. And then you could see that this is like maybe a lessons learned issue. And I could apply that filter. And then it's only going to show me those issues um, that were associated to that. Okay. Any other questions, things I might've missed just scanning the chat there's a lot of yeah there's so many in there it's like so wonderful that we've had so many so many people asking questions and sharing information answering questions and it seems like really that's the kind of name of the game is that everything is kind of seamlessly integrated through the platform or that's really the attempt that's being made is if all of these different pieces of the Autodesk construction cloud or whatever it is called tomorrow uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> then you know it's all integrated right you can view it all from the web interface there's easily uh, hyperlinks made to all of these things and it's very easy to navigate is the idea yeah exactly and I think that's Autodesk focus is you know truly making things integrated so that as you're going you know from design to be able to go to um, MEP coordination and be able to just tie it right back into Revit so you can make those quick easy changes and then everything's out and already ready to go for the field as well and there's that seamless workflow. So that's kind of been a big focus um, lately. Um, I did want to say if you have, if there's additional questions, you know, we can definitely follow up. Um, you know, there's lots of training materials online. Um, we can publish any of those links as well. I know Darren's posting some of those. And then, um, I mean, if there's other questions, we can definitely open. Maybe there's another chat on LinkedIn or something we can open. I'm not sure if you do that, Dana, or whatever. Absolutely. Um, you can post information there. We will definitely post all the links, the white papers, anything that Nicole and, and Ali after the fact share with us. So definitely check out that in addition to future presentations uh, based on all the chatter today. We'll definitely look through some of this and see if there's anything that we might be able to focus on next month. And once again, please fill out that survey so that we know what in particular you're interested on. So yes, definitely check out the LinkedIn group and you know, that's what that's there for so we can foster ideas and share communication, right? Get you guys all connected. So absolutely. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, if there's any follow-up, um, feel free to reach back out to us, Dana, and we can, I mean, we covered like skim the surface of things. So if there's some <laughs> specific right. workflows that people are interested in, we can really spend some time and actually dive into those. And Yeah. Don't forget about Autodesk AU or Autodesk University, there is a lot of content in there too. And I know a couple of the people actually joined have content there. They're very useful. So, so absolutely. And we also have a lot of links on AU and a lot of the sessions uh, on the BIMXT group because we've had a lot of the presenters right. <laughs> present to us. So definitely check out that, you know, they, their website for Autodesk University is actually pretty great because you can look at all of the different years within one platform. So if you're looking for something in particular, you know, you can find a lot of information. So absolutely. Well, guys, looks like everybody's jumping off. So we will go ahead and let everybody go. Thanks again so much. Thank you so much, Nicole and Ali. That was so informative. I feel like we really did learn quite a bit of information, even myself, you know, even that project homepage. I feel like I have skimmed over that way too often. Um, so thank you all so much. And thank you all for the present, uh, the participants for joining us today and communicating with us. So right. hope everybody has a wonderful day and is staying warm.